Vladimir Putin has addressed this. He said, we won't start the war. We have a nuclear doctrine that's quite clear. But if you hit us with nuclear weapons or if you use conventional weapons that threaten our nuclear deterrence, we will respond. We understand that we will go to heaven as martyrs, but you'll go to hell as the people who started a nuclear war. That's the Russian approach. The other thing that Vladimir Putin has said, and I'm saying this because there's people out there who say, well, Russia's just bluffing. He has gone on national TV and spoken to the Russian people and said, there will be no phone calls. There will be no negotiations. All orders have been signed. All orders have been issued. When the time comes, it will happen instantaneously. Well, right now, the United States has approximately 100,000 troops in Europe. Um, that's not enough to wage a, wage a, a war today. Um, but, it, you know, it's enough for a, a presence, a, a tripwire. But if there was a war with Russia, um, NATO would need to mobilize a considerable amount of combat capable troops. They simply don't have them today. This 300,000 rapid deployment force exists only on paper at the moment. But one of the problems NATO has is because it's a peacetime military alliance. How do you get troops from the port to Eastern Europe? All the NATO logistics that existed in the past got troops from NATO ports or NATO airfields in Western Europe to Germany, which was the front line. West Germany was the front line with uh, East Germany, the Soviet Union, etc. But now that the NATO has expanded to the Russian frontier with Poland, the Baltic states, um, Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, there isn't infrastructure to support this. Uh, and there's insufficient troops in. We used to have 300,000 troops in Europe and could deploy another 250, 300,000 within 10 days. Today, we have 100,000 and we don't have the ability to surge forces in. And so any reinforcement to take place is we'd be bringing troops over on ships. They'll arrive in ports. One of the big ports they would arrive would be in Hamburg or Antwerp. Previously, they'd get off the course and ride on German highways to a German front line. Now they have to cross borders. NATO hasn't figured out how to move troops from one nation to the next how to do customs clearance, how to avoid bottlenecks. Two, none of their highways or bridges have been reinforced to handle large scale military movement. So even once they allowed it to happen, the infrastructure would collapse. Three, there's no redundancy, meaning that if there's one bridge over the river that you got to get your army over and the Russians blow up that bridge, you don't have a plan B. D, how do you get troops that you, you, you can get them to Poland, but how do you get them to Romania? How do you get them uh, to Finland now that Finland joined? And so what NATO's doing now, they just did an exercise uh, in, for instance, in Norway, landing a couple hundred American and Finnish and Norwegian Marines. And they wanted to get them to Finland to get them from Norway over the mountains, down through Sweden, up into Finland to the front line. They realized the infrastructure doesn't exist. So if Russia was to go to war with Finland, NATO couldn't reinforce Finland, even though they promised them they could. So they have to spend money now building super highways, new bridges, port facilities, and then they have to plan. What happens when Antwerp no longer exists because the Russians took it out? Where do you land? What's your plan B port? And this is what this plan is right now. NATO is saying, we can't do this. So we have to have come up with a plan to do it. The bad news is it makes it look like NATO and Russia are going to war. You know what the good news is, Jimmy? They can't do it. It's too expensive. Is that to it's scare us? Right. So why? Yeah. So so has Putin been threatening to go to war with these smaller countries? No. Putin has been saying the exact all Putin has done is defeat NATO and their proxy Ukraine in Ukraine. Um, NATO, Putin has humiliated NATO. The defeat of NATO's technological superiority. You remember when the Leopard tank was the magic weapon? Yeah. But they found out that it burns. They, 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 the Abrams was the magic tank. Oh, it burns too. There's no such thing as a magic weapon. All the weapons that the West thought would give it the technological edge over the Russians don't. 
HIMARS, that multiple launch rocket system. It uses a GPS guided warhead. The Russians jam it. The HIMARS doesn't hit what it's supposed to hit. The same thing with ATACMS, it gets jammed. There are no magic weapons, and this is humiliating NATO. And the other thing NATO realizes, and General Cavoli, who's the US commander of uh, ground forces, said, NATO had never imagined the scope and scale of the violence taking place in Ukraine. They weren't prepared to suffer the casualties for the sustainability factors. And so what's happened is that NATO realizes it can't fight the Russians, that the Russians have the better army, the better way of doing this. And so NATO now is screaming. They have to turn to their taxpayers and say, you got to pump up hundreds of billions of dollars now to rebuild our military. And the taxpayers are saying, why? Why are we going to do that? Well, because the Russians are threatening to invade. The Russians aren't threatening to invade. All Russia's done is beat NATO in a war that NATO started. So why then would this, why, so it says revealed. So that means that on purpose, NATO revealed this plan. For us to be scared. Is, and who is that? Is that for us to be scared? What's this for? Well, I think the reality is somebody in NATO went, this is insane. And they revealed it because remember, this is just paper. These are just words. Those 300,000 troops don't exist. They haven't recruited them yet. They haven't trained them yet. Germany, to give you an example, has said that they're going to expand this battalion they have, a couple hundred men in, as I think, Lithuania, to a brigade of 4,000 men. Oh, they're supposed to make everybody scared on that. It may not happen because Germany has to first recruit the troops who agreed to be stationed overseas. They can't just take a, a brigade out of their army and station in Lithuania. The Constitution prohibits that. So they have to recruit 4,000 Germans who agree to be stationed overseas. And then they have to equip them, which means they have to build new tanks and armored vehicles. Except they can't because America blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, which brought in the cheap gas, which allowed the, 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 um, you know, the, the steel plants to produce steel. Those steel plants had to shut down because they can't afford to produce steel. Germany can't make steel to make tanks. They can't make the tanks to make the to build the battalions to this is all of nato is a disaster like this it's just a one big giant cluster you know what and um that so i think what happened here is a, somebody looked in there and said we need to nip this madness in the bud let's reveal this plan so that scott ritter can mock it on jimmy Dore's show and kill it <laughs> and so that's what this is so this isn't anything to actually be afraid of we can't do it that's like me, Jimmy, that's like you say, you know, okay, Jimmy, tonight I'm announcing that I'm, um, I'm gonna build a space rocket and I'm gonna go to Mars. And you're, and, and you're like, oh my God, if Scott goes to Mars, that'll disrupt the universal balance. We're all <laughs> Scott ain't going to Mars because Scott can't build a rocket. NATO can't do anything that's on that headline. They can't do any of that. So, so, uh, so I, you know, what, I, so Biden recently gave the go ahead for Ukraine to go ahead and attack targets inside Russia. Yeah. Um, is that act? Is that actually a major escalation? And I saw Medvedev kind of hint that this could turn nuclear. Is that also something we should worry about? This is where I have to get really, really serious right now, because I, I try to answer things. I mean, I answer it honestly, but like that headline's a joke. Um, so I, I bring humor into it. You know, the, uh, the the Bulletin of American Atomic Scientists, uh, they, they have a thing called the Doomsday Clock. And uh, recently they set it at 90 seconds. They say we're 90 seconds until midnight. Um, I'm here to tell you right now that if you were being honest about the Doomsday Clock, you would set it at one millisecond to midnight. And what I mean by that is as you and I are speaking right now, this is the most dangerous situation the world has found itself in since the Cuban Missile Crisis. We are this close to a thermonuclear war. Uh, one miscalculation, one mistake. As we are talking, this miscalculation took, could occur. And uh, the Russians will send nuclear weapons into Europe. We will retaliate and the world will end within a matter of a span of an hour and a half. Um, this is real. I hope everybody listening to me right now goes to bed and, and, and shakes and is scared because you need to be scared. You need to start calling people in Washington, D.C. saying, what the hell are you thinking? Because the whole purpose 
of allowing the Ukrainians to do this is to bring harm to Russia in hopes that Russia will accept a peace plan coming out of a peace conference that's taking place in a week that isn't going to take place because nobody's going to attend because the Ukrainians are a joke. But we can't admit that. So we give the Ukrainians permission to do what the Ukrainians say they want to do, which is to bring harm to Russia in Russia. If you go back, Jim, just to put this in perspective, go back to, you know who Ray McGovern is. I, yes. I, the former CIA guy, great guy. Yes. Um, you know, in the buildup before this became a war between Russia and Ukraine, the, the Russians actually submitted a draft peace treaty to the United States and said, this is, this is how we could prevent a war by talking about how to come up with equitable um, relationships. In the discussion that the Russians had with the United States, they said, what we really fear is that you're gonna put missiles in Ukraine and those missiles are gonna strike our strategic facilities. Because you see, when the Soviet Union existed, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. Right. So all of the strategic things, the command centers, the missile silos and everything, we're in the center of Russia, far away from NATO. It took NATO a long time to get there. But when, if Ukraine joins NATO and you put these American missiles up to the front line, they can now strike Russia's strategic command and control. And Russia said back then before the war, if you put missiles in Ukraine, it will be a war. Jimmy, we put attackums missiles with a 300 kilometer range, uh, a 300 mile range, a uh, 300 mile range in Ukraine and the Ukrainians are using them to strike targets in Russia. Targets, the, the range arc includes command and control, radars, missile silos, nuclear storage facilities. Russia cannot allow this to happen. They can't, it's existential in nature. And if Ukraine makes a mistake right now as we talk, if Ukraine makes a mistake and fires a missile that hits a Russian command and control center, Russia will nuke Europe. Really? Right now as we speak. Well, I mean, so doesn't Russia understand that that would also mean the nuclear annihilation of Russia? Vladimir Putin has addressed this. He said, we won't start the war. We have a nuclear doctrine that's quite clear. But if you hit us with nuclear weapons or if you use conventional weapons that threaten our nuclear deterrence, we will respond. We understand that we will go to heaven as martyrs, but you'll go to hell as the people who started a nuclear war. That's the Russian approach. The other thing that Vladimir Putin has said, and I'm saying this because there's people out there who say, well, Russia's just bluffing. He has gone on national TV and spoken to the Russian people and said, there will be no phone calls. There will be no negotiations. All orders have been signed. All orders have been issued. When the time comes, it will happen instantaneously. I, do you think Americans are just so used to living with nuclear weapons and they think that they'll never be used? No, I, I think what happened is, I mean, because we lived with nuclear weapons in the 50s, 60s and 70s and early 80s, and we were scared to death. I can tell I grew up there, Jimmy. I, I was scared. I lived in West Germany. Uh, I lived next to a nuclear weapons storage facility. My dad was a commissioned officer in the Air Force at a headquarters. Uh, on occasion, he would go into the bunker which you go into the bunker when you're ready to go to war. He would call my mom and say, gather the kids because this might be it tonight. Um, the whole world might end. And we would be there because we lived next to the nuclear storage facility that would get hit with a nuclear weapon and we would die. I played football when my dad was in the bunker. They had an Audubon going by. And you know how when uh, sunlight hits a rear view mirror, hits a windshield, every once while you get that, that flash? Yeah. I'm on the football field looking at flashes on the Audubon thinking, oh shit, oh, excuse me, oh, that's it, it's over. As a freaking high school kid, I was scared to death of nuclear weapons because they were an ever-present reality. I learned to respect nuclear weapons, which is why when I was a weapons inspector in the Soviet Union in 1988 to 1990, destroying these very same weapons, I was so damn happy because I said, we're getting rid of these things. We're creating peace and harmony in the world. I might grow up to have children and grandchildren, yay. And then we went into this period of time where the weapons still existed, but people forgot about them. People forgot to be afraid of them. People don't think they're real. 
people can't imagine that they're going to be used. I'm here to tell everybody in your audience that the United States, like Russia, has a nuclear war plan. You know how we win the nuclear war? This is the sickest part. By being the largest remaining civilization on the planet. Now, some estimates say that we will be down to 40 to 30 or 40 percent of our current capacity. That, but if we, as long as we can be the largest remaining civilization, we will continue American global domination in a post-nuclear environment. That's the definition of victory in a nuclear war. And this nuclear war could happen literally right now as we speak because of the strange life. So why, why aren't there? So why aren't there? Why do you think there isn't more people screaming with their hair on fire about this to stop the Biden administration from letting Ukraine do this? Well, I mean, I tried. I, I, I was supposed to speak at the Rage Against the War Machine uh, rally, right. and the, you know, the Libertarians shut me down because I'm a bad guy. Apparently, right. um, I've been screaming till I'm blue in the face. Um, the 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 problem is, again, I'll just be honest. The the anti-war movement in America is so fractured; they just can't get along. They're a bunch of hippies that um, you know have their own. They want their own slice of the pie, and they just can't agree. In 1982, in June of 1982. The anti-war movement put a million people into Central Park to protest against nuclear weapons and to protest in favor of arms control. Ronald Reagan, the crazy, communist-hating Republican president from hell, he's the guy that signed the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, Jimmy. He's the guy that sent me to Russia to get rid of those weapons. He was influenced by a million Americans marching in Central Park. Why can't we get a million Americans marching in Central Park today? Why, for, on this, survival, the very survival of our nation, of the world. Why can't we motivate all these people out there to realize that any other cause you have is meaningless if the world ceases to exist? You know, the, well, again, the first, when we first came up with the nuclear war plan, um, John F. Kennedy was the first president to be briefed on it. It was called the Single Integrated Operation Plan, or PSYOP. He went to the Pentagon to get briefed on it. When the Pentagon briefed him that the plan was to destroy the world, to keep America then, Kennedy turned to his advisor and said, and, and we call ourselves the human race. And then he screamed at the guys. He said, this is insane, literally insane. You can't ask me to push the button to destroy the world. You have to give me options. Then he was assassinated. When, when uh, Lyndon Johnson became president, he was briefed on it. You know what his response was? This is insane. You can't ask me to destroy the world. You have to give me options. But the Pentagon only has one option, destroy the world. They pretend to have other options. They've briefed every president uh, up during the Cold War on that. Every single president, including Ronald Wilson Reagan, said, this is insane. You have to give me options. And then the Cold War ended. And then we forgot about nuclear war. We forgot that there was this plan there. And then George W. Bush, after 9-11, said, we can never allow this to happen again. We have nuclear weapons. Find a way to make them relevant again. And now we lived in an environment where there was no more Soviet Union. We didn't have a threat. And so we started to use our nuclear supremacy as a way of leveraging global power. And we now have guys who have reimagined nuclear war using the same models that we used back in the 60s. That when we go to war, if there is a nuclear exchange between the United States and Russia and the United States and China, our goal is to keep enough of our civilization intact that we are the largest surviving civilization while we destroy the rest of the world. I would like to ask Joe Biden, because here's, here's the thing, Jimmy, to show you this. Joe Biden knows this because he's been in the Senate. He's been, in, he's been the vice president. When he ran for president, he said, I want to change the nuclear posture of the United States to uh, a deterrence only model, meaning that it's a single use a, that we only have nuclear weapons for one thing. And that's if you drop nuclear weapons on us, we use nuclear weapons against you. That's it. Sole use. He promised that he would do this. I went to an INF a reunion, Intermediate Nuclear Forces reunion, where all the arms control people, the inspectors, the negotiators were there. And they brought in a senior administration official uh, who asked to remain anonymous. Um, and they were asked the question by us, the guys who got rid of nuclear weapons, who know something about arms control. We said, the president ran on this platform. Why didn't it happen? He's the commander in chief. Why didn't he keep this promise, the most critical promise? And they said, well, the, the interagency wasn't ready for this. 
Now, did the you vote for the inner agency in the last election, Jimmy? Did you see them on the ballot? The inner agency? The inner agency. So that's the, the deep state. Agency. That's the group of the Defense Department, the CIA, Department of Energy. They, the Nazis. They, they basically, this the establishment, come together in a group, in a cabal, and they control the national security of the United States. The inner agency wasn't ready for this. Well, I mean, my God, couldn't the president just say, hey, inner agency, you're fired. You're all fired. You're all unemployed right now. I and I won't hire people that are ready to do this. But Joe Biden backed down because every president backs down because you can't take on the establishment. And Which, that's the problem. Well, there, absolutely. Uh, you know, the irony here, and I, I, again, forgive my smile, Jimmy. Sometimes things are just so ridiculous that you have to smile. And if you don't find humor in life, you go insane. But the irony is all these guys who fall in love with nuclear war now, they think that all that infrastructure still exists. They think they're going to live. But what they don't realize is when the Cold War ended, we stopped funding that. I used to train as a firefighter in, uh, in hazmat response. We would do uh, railroad rescue operations in one of these places where they used to have a train line going into a tunnel into a mountain. Um, where they would take all the congressmen and everything in there to hide. Well, they shut that facility down. They haven't been maintaining it. It's mothballed. And we've been using those tracks to train on derailment. And these guys believe that if they have a nuclear war, they're going to get on a train and it's going to take them someplace to live. They're going to show up in one of these facilities and realize that the filters haven't been serviced and uh, radioactivity is going to come down. They said, well, that can't happen. You should. Well, you guys didn't fund the servicing of the filters. The water supply hasn't been replenished. You're all going to die. And I just hope that I'm still alive when the flash comes in their head that they screwed up, that they thought they were going to be part of the 30% to survive. And the realization is nobody survives because nobody's ready for what a nuclear war is going to bring on this world.